Retour aux années 20, au début des années 20. Une autre révolution se prépare, une autre secousse terrible qui va plonger l'Europe entière dans la désolation et dans l'horreur. Je sais que le mot de révolution va étonner. Je sais qu'on ne l'emploie guère d'habitude pour ce dont je vais parler maintenant. Mais hélas, le fait est là. Les témoignages de l'époque sont là. Et si l'on veut rester fidèle au principe de ce récit, si l'on veut continuer de raconter les choses comme les acteurs eux-mêmes les ont vécues, en essayant de retrouver l'état d'esprit qui était le leur, leurs illusions, leurs vrais motifs, il faut bien admettre ceci, avant d'être une dictature et un régime de terreur, avant d'être la plus effroyable, la plus infâme machine de mort jamais imaginée dans toute l'histoire humaine, le fascisme puisque c'est du fascisme qu'il s'agit, est d'abord un ébranlement révolutionnaire qui, à tort ou à raison, apparaît à certains comme la suite de ce qui s'est passé à Moscou en octobre 1917. L'ébranlement commence en fait en Italie. Theirs is a very strange ideology, many of its themes borrowed in fact from a Frenchman, Georges Sorel, author of Reflections and Violence, an advocate of the general strike and an admirer of Lenin and the Soviet Revolution. Benito Mussolini is a somewhat comical figure who will very soon show himself to be a dictator without scruples. At the beginning of the story, however, He comes across as something of a crusader against the established order. The shock waves emanating from Rome are soon felt in Germany, with another leader, swept up by popular enthusiasm, a charismatic leader, the people's choice, a man who brings together supporters from the left and the right, nationalists and socialists. Radical conservatives like Hermann Rauschning or Bolshevik nationalists like Otto Strasser. And Hitler too is seen as an uncompromising non-conformist. He is certainly a barbarian, a sinister, grotesque dictator who often seems to be aping Chaplin's imitation of him. But for his contemporaries, and especially for the Frenchmen who view the spectacle from afar, he is the extraordinary inventor of a new political order. But what are the French up to at this point? And what of those intellectuals who survived the killing fields of the First World War, but have not heeded the siren song of communism, remaining faithful to the political heritage found, for example, in the writings of the nationalist Maurice Barrez? They too are sickened. They share the popular conviction that the values of the old social order are unsalvageable. And the only explanation they find is that they were carried along, these puppets, by an instinct which bound them to their race, their blood, their land. It is the generation of the author Henri de Monterland and his young First World War warriors, as proud as characters straight out of Plutarch. It could have been the generation of Céline if he were not quite so somber, so infinitely despairing. It is, in any case, the generation of Pierre de La Rochelle who will achieve with his comedy of Charleroi a great literary success. Je suis surtout content de ce résultat parce que j'ai écrit un livre sur la guerre et que dans ce livre, j'ai voulu affirmer, en dehors de toute question de parti, des opinions très nettes et auxquelles je tiens passionnément depuis des années. All of them, moreover, hate the period they live in. They despise the France of the daily aperitif and the corner shop of bogus governments carried along by intrigue, scheming, false promises and all those lies. 
the political scandals of this period add to the disillusion that semblance of virtue required by all true fascism. Our intellectuals find themselves, if only in spirit, on the side of the rioters who, on the famous night of February the 6th, 1934, occupy the streets of Paris and, intoxicated by hatred and the smell of gunpowder, almost succeed in overthrowing the government. But the riots fail, of course. And when it comes to counting the dead and the banners of the old France which the rabble have trampled, they must admit the obvious, France is certainly not ready to follow in the footsteps of her neighbors. Especially because they also know, and this is probably the worst, that the only forces they can muster to mount the assault are rather pathetic leagues, bearing little resemblance to the SA or the squadrons of black shirt, an extreme right that has gone stale, a bowler hat at patriotism, and even though he retains something of his former aura and glory achieved during the Dreyfus era, a Charles Maurras, who is exhausted. Toute la jeunesse de droite, qui était devenue antidémocratique par indignation, par colère contre les scandales qui avaient éclaté, contre ce que la civilisation de l'argent avait fait du mécanisme démocratique. Ces gens-là n'avaient qu'une solution que leur donnait un grand intellectuel de leur temps, Charles Maurras. Ils attendaient que la France se, pro se prononce pour le retour du roi pour remplacer la République. C'était une idée d'intellectuel, justement, et une idée qui n'avait aucune chance de se réaliser. Alors, euh, pendant ce temps-là, en Allemagne, en Italie, en Espagne, apparaissaient des régimes de renouveau, de vigueur, d'enthousiasme. Il s'était fait une unanimité autour d'un chef. On avait l'impression d'une espèce de bonheur qui naissait autour de nous, qui nous invitait et qui nous disait « Mais enfin, pourquoi vous, Français, qui avez toujours été à la tête de l'Europe, pourquoi vous ne nous accompagnez pas en trouvant une version française du fascisme qui sera aussi une unanimité du peuple français ?» Here on his way to Nuremberg is the writer Robert Brasillac, a disciple of Maurras and a collaborator under the wartime occupation. Here he is at Goering's window in ecstasy before the banners of the Nazi Party Congress. He so much wanted this kind of gaudy spectacle and fanfare in his own country. Here he is between two processions. He says between two ceremonies, two mystic communions. In the studio of the sculptor, Arno Brecker, admiring these naked bodies, this glorification of strength and of youth, which reminds him of the Greco-Roman culture that so enchanted him as a student at the Ecole Normale. Here, as he wanders around the German countryside, he is amazed at the spectacle of a man, both very new and very ancient, a man who doubts neither his blood nor his land. And here, back in Nuremberg, in a sort of scout's camp, where he discovers, as he says, the young fascist, upheld by his race, proud of his vigorous body, scornful of worldly comfort. The young fascist surrounded by his friends, the young fascist who marches, who works, who dreams. He is, first and foremost, a joyous being. This intellectual who sees in fascism the very poetry of the 20th century is Robert Brasillac. Here is another one, Pierre Drieux La Rochelle. He too, haunted by the decadence of France, in his eyes the most reactionary country in Europe, makes the trip in his turn. He visits Dachau, the concentration camp already opened for two years, and is given a guided tour. The visit of the camp, he will write, was amazing. I don't think they hid much from me. The dominant impression was of admirable comfort and uncompromising discipline. Even if, he adds, one must note with regret, unfortunately, a certain persistent and determined resistance among some inmates. We have followed him to the old Nuremberg Stadium to try to understand what this refined, subtle writer could possibly have had in his head when here before the Nazi Party Congress, he speaks 
of an amazingly beautiful spectacle worthy of classical tragedy. What are we when faced with this, he cries. I have seen nothing so beautiful since the Acropolis. My heart is saddened at the thought that all of this is unknown in France. Strangely, but maybe it isn't so strange after all, he rushes to Moscow, where he's not badly received either, because with an introduction from his friends Nizan and Malraux, he's sure of a guided visit of the city. I did awfully well to come, he sighs, although in the end he cannot resist the poetry of Berlin. Author of a book on Jacques Doriot, the communist turned fascist, this is Pierre Drieux La Rochelle. Here, several years later, in the middle of the occupation, is an organized trip of artists this time. Another one. Here is Berlin in Paris. Here in Paris still, those who sing the praises of total collaboration. Now, following the moment of the Earth's Thieves, comes a time of raging fanaticism for a German Europe. Son rang de grande puissance européenne et coloniale. Même le chef de la nation allemande, Adolf Hitler, qui a pris la tête de la croisade européenne. Ich bekenne mich, so rief Anglio aus zu Adolf Hitler, der den Kreuzzug Europas gegen den Bolschewismus fuhr. Et même si la France n'a pas encore totalement compris. Et avec nos compagnons d'Europe. Dorio spricht. Er sagt, jeder Franzose, der sein Land und seine Kultur liebt, muss jetzt im Augenblick der Gefahr klar und männlich Stellung nehmen für Europa. And here, well before the war, and starting in Berlin, is a time of lynchings, of synagogue burnings, and of Jewish ruins all over Europe. Events which not one of these delicate minds could possibly have ignored. For the most radical of them, these were their newspapers, their style, and their obsessions. Laissons là le regret du passé. Faisons confiance au maréchal qui nous a montré la route et qui a accompli les premiers gestes libérateurs en édictant le statut des Juifs. Here are the films they go along with. L'idéal ne guide dans l'existence ces êtres sordides, hideux, que la paresse achemine vers l'abêtissement le plus évident. Mais défions-nous toutefois. L'instinct racial est là qui veille. La loi millénaire du Talmud n'évoque-t-elle pas les recommandations de Canaan à ses fils Aimez la rapine, aimez la débauche, haïssez vos maîtres et ne dites jamais la vérité. Here is the type of exhibition they support. Comparons le juif à un rat. Semblable au mammifère rongeur dont il partage la lâcheté et la cruauté sournoise. Le juif porte en lui un irrésistible besoin de destruction. La puissance d'action du juif se manifeste dans la supériorité numérique de ses disciples. De même que la pullulation des rats porte atteinte à la salubrité des hommes. Here is an eminent author who does not content himself with acceptance, not even with support but will actually contribute to the pervading atmosphere of frenzy in pre- and post-war times, some of its most infamous texts. Je n'ai jamais été violent. 
Je vais vous en soigner avec beaucoup de, de douceur, si j'ose dire. Tous ceux qui m'ont approché, j'ai sauvé énormément de gens et d'animaux. De... À la guerre, j'ai vécu dans bien des milieux. J'ai bien violence. Je dis, j'ai vécu dans la violence. Euh, mais moi-même, je, je, je ne l'avais absolument pas. unforgivable, perhaps also the most incomprehensible, Brasillac again, recommending that we should separate ourselves from the Jews en masse and not even keep the children. Cela dit, attention, ces fascistes-là, ces fascistes durs, ces fascistes à la remorque de l'Allemagne et presque en chemise brune, ces fascistes vociférateurs, ces fascistes de grands guignols et de cauchemars, ne sont pas pour autant tous les fascistes. Et je me demande si, en y insistant trop, en mettant trop systématiquement l'accent sur ces coupables parfaits, que sont au fond ces lignes de rieux, brasillac ou rebattais, on n'exonère pas un peu vite. Des hommes plus convenables, meilleurs chics, meilleurs genres. Des hommes qui parlaient une langue plus ordinaire et plus civile. Et qui sont peut-être, du coup, plus représentatifs de cette histoire. Je sais que je vais toucher, là aussi, des zones sensibles de notre mémoire nationale. Mais à quoi bon cette enquête à quoi bon ce retour aux sources, si ce n'est pour essayer de retrouver le vrai visage des choses. This Catholic Review, for example, which the young writer and journalist Thierry Monnier contributed to, isn't a fascist publication. And this other non-conformist publication, which denounces with equal vigor capitalism and communism, has no obvious connection with Nazi doctrine. Or again, Esprit the magazine created by Emmanuel Mounier, the Christian philosopher who would later join the resistance. As early as 1933, this magazine takes a stand against Hitler's anti-Semitism and in 1940 distances itself from Germany. And yet it is difficult not to shudder when all these publications tell us that this country, ruined and devastated by war, is like a building site from which a new, regenerated France will be reborn. The contributors to Esprit, for example, don't talk of a national revolution. They do, however, remind readers that they have been deepening and disseminating for years the precepts of Pétain's new regime. They recognize in their words the dominant traits of their heritage. And it would therefore be ungracious for them to draw away from the living adventure that the Vichy regime is embarking upon. The truth is that here and elsewhere, a whole way of thinking is taking shape which takes great care to differentiate itself from Nazism and which is predominantly French in inspiration. The tone is at times pastoral, almost bucolic, with a return to the land. Yet it has, as well, a modern aspect, even modernist. It is always forgotten that it was during the Vichy regime that systematic planning was born, and even, who would have believed it, the cult of technocracy. There is a family tone, as it was also at that time that Mother's Day was invented. A patriotic tone, because the typical Pétain supporter, lest we forget, was a Frenchman and proud of it. And he was, of course, against the Bosch. The sporting aspect, with this muscle city, the French version of the youth camps we saw earlier on and which allowed Monterland, author of Les Olympiques and L'Angelus sur le Stade, to let loose his passion for all things Roman, pagan and virile.
there is also a veneration of youth. And it is a curious fact that such fascination for youth, attributing to it every possible virtue and prestige, is a fact to which all totalitarian regimes have in common, the Pétain regime being no exception. And finally, here near Grenoble, is the famous management college at Uriage, which was created in 1940 with the intention of providing the regime with its future intellectuals. Some people believe that Uriage had a marked, though perhaps not extreme, fascist tendency. Here again, we have come back to the scene and we have interviewed a witness from that period. Parmi ceux qui participaient au stage du riage, au colloque du riage, aux conférences du riage, où il y avait d'ailleurs beaucoup de gens d'esprit qui à l'époque étaient là, c'était un milieu assez étonnant, euh, qui était par certains côtés euh, partisan d'un certain péténisme, mais d'un péténisme national, jamais collaborateur. Et au sein de ce milieu, il y avait ceux qui déjà se présenter comme les futurs leaders de la résistance. In November 1942, when the Germans enter the unoccupied zone of France, thereby abruptly ending any fantasy of a French-style fascism, these young intellectuals, as Jacques Baumel has just said, will courageously take to the Maquis. But not without having for a moment dreamed of what must be called a French version of the European Revolution. And in fact, these highly regarded writers were far more numerous than the more extreme supporters of Germany. Et puis, il y a tout de même l'autre France. Je dis encore une fois l'autre France, car j'aime cette idée comme à l'époque de l'affaire Dreyfus, de ces deux France qui s'affrontent bloc contre bloc, valeur contre valeur, sans aucune espèce de merci ni de compromis possible. Cette autre France, cette France qui refuse donc le double visage du fascisme, cette France qui ne trempera le jour venu ni dans le côté Hitler, ni dans le côté Vichy, cette France digne, cette France noble, cette France qu'il ne faut pas idéaliser non plus, bien sûr, car elle eut aussi forcément sa part d'ombre. C'est tout de même elle qui nous lègue ce bel et lumineux héritage que l'on appellera, pour aller vite, la culture antifasciste. One finds, of course, all sorts of people in antifascist France, old friends we left behind in the first episode, and who are less concerned with questions of liberty. I'm thinking of the novelist Romain Roland. Or of Henri Barbus, the founder of the communist review Clarté. Of very young writers such as Albert Cohen, who ten years before the publication of Solal, 40 years before Belle du Seigneur, created the magazine which would publish the works of Freud, Einstein, Werfel, Martin Buber, and Marcel Proust, who makes clear his support of cultural values that have become threatened. There is Julien Binda, the author of The Treason of the Intellectuals, and traditional liberals of a more peaceful inclination. And, last but not least, Gide and Malraux, who at the beginning of 1934 Following the Reichstag fire, when the Nazis tried to incriminate the communist Dimitrov, decide to go to Germany to plead this innocent man's case. Their biographers, strangely, know next to nothing about this trip, so we have attempted to retrace their steps from this Berlin station, completely demolished today, where they arrived arm in arm. Malraux, the young author of The Conquerors, and Gide, the old immoralist. Imagine them, these two celebrities, as they jaunt around the streets, killing time while they await the audience they had requested with Hitler or Goebbels. I expect they go to the Reichstadt just to see the scene of the crime. They come back and wander around the station. 
Malraux might well have imagined a chance encounter with de Rieu La Rochelle, his friend who passed through here too, but already in the opposite camp. What would they have said to each other? Would they adhere to their rule of avoiding politics? It is a time for contempt. A time for book burning. And even though our two friends in the end fail to obtain their audience, they do glean precious information on the increasingly barbarian nature of Germany, which will, on their return, provide ample material for great speeches. But this is a time of meetings and conferences. It is a time of a great anti-fascist mobilization and of the famous Comité de Vigilance des Intellectuels Antifascistes. The founders are now dead, but we had the opportunity before he passed away to meet one of the last survivors of the Comité. Look, it is hard to believe that this famous specialist in pre-Columbian civilizations, this member of the Académie Française, this man who supported the extremists of the OAS during the Algerian war, was an anti-fascist of the first order. But yes, his name is Jacques Soustel. In 1934, était au plus profond de la forêt du sud-est du Mexique. Et à la sortie de la forêt, j'apprends par les journaux qu'il y avait eu de violents incidents à Paris, qu'il y avait eu des gens tués, que le gouvernement avait fait tirer au pont de la Concorde, etc. J'étais évidemment très, très ému. Et je me suis mis en rapport avec mon professeur et mon grand ami Paul Rivet, et qui était le directeur du Musée de l'Homme. À ce moment-là, j'ai appris l'existence du comité de vigilance des intellectuels antifascistes, dont il était un des fondateurs, avec Paul Langevin, le physicien, et avec le philosophe Alain. Alors, naturellement, j'ai adhéré. Il y avait euh, des gens, d'une façon générale, qui, évidemment, étaient euh, anxieux, de la situation en Europe occidentale et notamment en Allemagne. Il y avait aussi le fait que euh, on voyait grandir un risque de guerre. Et euh, il y avait dans le CVIA une tendance plus pacifiste, si vous voulez, que proprement antifasciste. Il y avait des gens qui étaient davantage pour la liberté et d'autres davantage pour la paix. I would not want to conclude without saying at least a word about those poets who, surrealists though they were, threw themselves feet first into the battle and were to a certain extent involved in the creation of the popular front. These exceptional, haughty writers, inspired by Nietzsche, passionately interested in theology and who believed neither in progress, nor good, nor mankind, nonetheless proposed to save the world from the carnage and were the only people to think seriously about fascism at the time. They operated from small groups, one could almost say sects, that range from the group Contre-Attaque, founded by Breton and Bataille, to Acéphal, the tiny secret society of which very little is really known. Or to the Collège de Sociologie, where in 1938 and 39, the very young sociologist Roger Caillois would meet up with the writer Pierre Klosowski and Walter Benjamin. Where the more skeptical Michel Leris would rub shoulders with the sociologist Anatole Levitsky, the future founder of the First Resistance Network. And where Georges Bataille would eloquently declare war on the spirit of Munich. Cette guerre, cela dit, a surtout été pour le moment une guerre en trompe-l'œil. On s'insulte, on se bat, on se tue parfois, on s'extermine mais à l'intérieur d'un monde qui reste pour l'essentiel un monde de mots et de papier. Or voilà que l'histoire, je veux dire l'histoire réelle, revient une nouvelle fois frapper l'un de ses grands coups et casser manœuvre de l'esprit 
elle vient conférer leur premier champ de bataille, grandeur nature. Ce champ aride et désolé, cette terre lyrique qui a donné au monde tant de mystiques et de saints, avant d'offrir au siècle maintenant l'un de ses premiers contingents de vrais martyrs, ce pays de souffrance qui va aimanter trois ans durant le destin de nos héros et transformer certains d'entre eux en poètes soldats, en romanciers aviateurs. C'est bien évidemment l'Espagne. So, as well as in France, a popular front government is now in power in Madrid. Some of the army refuse to recognize it, including most of the generals, amongst whom are those professional killers who, ten years earlier, put down the Rif Rebellion in Morocco. So in July 1936, when these generals rebel, a new war begins. It is terrible, of course, but clear enough for writers with a range of very different views to take an immediate stand. François Mauriac, for example, who isn't exactly a man of the popular front. Ce qui m'a mobilisé, c'est que Franco se disait catholique et se dressait comme un soldat de Dieu et de l'Église. Je crois que Quand on est chrétien et quand on est catholique, le premier devoir, c'est de lutter pour désolidariser le Christ des causes affreuses auxquelles on l'a lié. The writer Georges Bernanos, too, another Catholic and even royalist, who guesses right away that behind the Viva la Muerte of Franco's supporters is the shadow of Mussolini and also that of Hitler. A shadowy shame, darkening Europe. This is certainly the case too for a great number of left-wing writers who are not actually enlisted with the international brigades, but act as war reporters for well-known newspapers. Among these are Saint-Exupéry and Benjamin Perret. Dos Passos and Arthur Kostler, George Orwell, Anna Segers, Jean-Richard Bloch, as well as the Russian novelist Ilya Ehrenberg, correspondent for Izvestia. And the great Ernest Hemingway, who will go back to the USA and be an indefatigable propagandist for the Republican cause. This is the moment that all the rest of war prepares for. When six men go forward into death to walk across a stretch of land, their presence on it proved this earth is ours. The real symbol of this new breed of writer, who is to give it both its style and its legendary status, and who barely four days after the putsch will rush to Madrid, his fist raised, already dreaming of his future force of pilots and flying gunners, is none other than André Malraux. Listen to Paul Nothomb who acted as the political commissar of the squadron and who is one of the few survivors left today. Listen, just in case you're one of those clever people who distrust Malraux the bluffer, Malraux the mythomaniac. He didn't have any capacity of an aviator, but two or three times he had even taken the role of a mitrailleur before, because we were in the hypothesis 42, in which there were seven people, there were three mitrailleurs, un bombardier, moi en l'occurrence, deux pilotes et un mécanicien. Il y avait trois postes de, de mitrailleurs et Malraux, euh, souvent, les, il a raconté dès un moment qu'il a vu un avion fasciste qui est arrivé devant lui et quand il a vu la tête du pilote, il n'a pas pu tirer. Je m'appelle très bien Red sur Teloel, on avait la DCA qui secouait l'avion comme, comme euh, très, de façon très impressionnante et Malraux, je le vois encore au milieu de du couloir qui allait du poste de pilotage euh, mitrailleur arrière et il était là sans rien faire simplement parce qu'il voulait être avec nous pour montrer qu'il participait même s'il n'était pas à un poste de combat. Of course, not everything to do with this affair was so admirable and our valiant aviators will not always, alas, be beyond reproach. Take, for example, these militant PUM members and other anarchists from the province of Aragon, these unruly but courageous fighters who, taken by their Stalinist allies into the underground cell of the GPU prisons and finally understanding that they have been taken there to be massacred like dogs, 
will be shocked into confronting for the first time, though a little late in the day, a reality to which they had so far assiduously turned a blind eye. With the exception of this crime, which will for a long time represent the shadowy part of the picture, we can say that the Spanish Civil War is one of the truly great moments of our story. The moment, in any case, where most of our heroes are full of a passion for peace, which has so far been their only religion. Remaining with us eternally, and like the sweet sound of a beautiful poem, lingering to haunt subsequent generations, are these images from Espoir, an unfinished and rather thrown together film which Andre Malraux, who directed it, had to wind up quickly on that day in January 1938 when Franco's troops entered Barcelona. These images, through the magic of art, are likely to continue to evoke for a long time to come the days of hope which provided Malraux with the title of one of his greatest novels. Et puis c'est alors qu'arrive la guerre, la vraie, la mondiale, celle dont le drame espagnol va très vite apparaître comme la répétition générale et celle qui va plonger la France dans l'extrême humiliation. On a vu avec quel trouble sentiment toute une partie de l'intelligentsia a accueilli la chose. Je voudrais insister maintenant sur les autres, l'autre partie, ce parti des antifascistes qui savent, on vient de le voir, que la défense de la culture peut se faire les armes à la main et que le prix Goncourt peut vous mener dans les nuages de Teruel avant de vous installer dans les lambris des ministères. Rue de choix, là aussi, rue de bataille, une bataille qui traversant la gauche et la droite, l'église de ceux qui croient au ciel et celle de ceux qui n'y croient pas va conduire les plus audacieux d'entre eux jusqu'à la résistance. But what can an intellectual do faced with the scandal of occupied France? Well, he could, like Mauriac, become indignant and rebel against it. Tout était souillé depuis le trottoir où une barrière blanche nous obligeait à descendre jusqu'à ce ciel au-dessus de la place de la Concorde, où flottait le drapeau timbré de cette croix qui a toujours été pour moi une araignée noire, gonflée de sang. He could there again remain in exile, like Georges Bernanos, for example, who went to Brazil and from there bombarded the headquarters of Vichy with inspired and often scathing attacks. He could alternatively withdraw to Marseille, to the sunny Villa Bel Air, where the Surrealists would pass their time making their cadavres exquis, or organizing Max Ernst exhibitions in the garden, while Breton set up one of the magical circles which he had such a talent for. Our intellectual could set sail for the Caribbean and then New York, as many Surrealists had done, and meet up with other exiles such as Claude Lévi-Strauss. New York était à ce moment-là au sommet de son cosmopolitisme. Il y avait des réfugiés de tous les coins du monde. Il y avait des Allemands, il y avait des Italiens, il y avait des Français. Euh, et donc c'était un, un lieu extraordinaire enfin, pour euh, vivre un peu la pensée européenne, si vous voulez, bien qu'on ne fût pas en Europe. In New York, he could openly publish Gaullist texts or even played low-key like Breton, giving lectures at Yale on surrealism, taking trips to Canada, making literary tours, doing the odd radio show, perhaps. Or he could go to London, like the philosopher and sociologist Raymond Aron. J'ai réfléchi un peu, euh, déchiré entre les deux arguments. L'un que j'étais venu pour me battre, euh, et l'autre que Faire une revue à ce moment-là avait une certaine signification puisqu'il n'y avait plus de présence française en dehors de la France. Et à tort ou à raison, pour des motifs que moi-même je ne peux pas déchiffrer, j'ai décidé d'essayer, de, c'est-à-dire de contribuer à cette revue. He could even come back to Paris like Sartre, Aron's young friend. Puisque le venin nazi se glissait jusque dans notre pensée, chaque pensée juste était une conquête. 
Puisqu'une police toute puissante cherchait à nous contraindre au silence, chaque parole devenait précieuse comme une déclaration de principe. Puisque nous étions traqués, chacun de nos gestes avait le poids d'un engagement. Sartre was criticized for the production in 1943 of his play The Flies, which had had the stamp of approval of the German censorship authorities. But should that weigh so heavily against a man who, as soon as he came back in April 1941, founded with De Santi and others the clandestine group Socialisme et Liberté? In Paris, our wartime intellectual could climb the twisted staircase in the Rue Sébastien Botin, which leads to Jean Paulin's office. Here, this ex director of the Nouvelle Revue Francaise, who had said he would be a bastard to continue to write, takes incredible risks just a few steps away from the office of Drieux La Rochelle, the new director imposed by the Germans, and does so without breaking the bonds of their old friendship. What a strange pair. One could, like Pierre Segers and others, publish the poems of Aragon, the ex-surrealist become communist, defying censorship and torture to uphold the honor of poets. Apart from the work of Aragon, alias François Lacolaire, one could publish the works of Elsa Triolet, alias Laurent Daniel, Paul Éloire, or François Mauriac, alias Forès, or like Vercors, start up the publishing house des éditions de Minuit. Le Silence de la Mer a paru euh, en 1942, bien qu'il ait été terminé en 1941, mais euh, il fallait tout même organiser euh, toutes sortes de choses, une fois, une fois imprimé par euh, voilà, il fallait encore le faire brocher, c'était euh, broché par des amis euh, qui faisaient qu'ils les brochaient chez eux, on leur, leur avait appris comment faire. Et nous avons publié en moyenne euh, un livre par mois pendant deux ans. One could, again in the tradition of the international brigades, believing that freedom cannot be defended with books alone take to the maquis and trade in one's futile pen for more conventional weapons. Among these, Anatole Levitsky, who was close to Bataille in the Collège de Sociologie, Golitzer, the historian, Marc Bloch, the poet René Char, alias Captain Alexandre, the philosopher Jean Cavaillès, who, when his torturers tell him, do you know that you're going to die, responds the impeccable mathematician with, the truth never dies or, a little later, with his customary style and bravura, André Malraux, in Dordogne at first, then in Alsace, where he assumes the name of the hero of one of his novels, Colonel Berger, and commands the legendary Alsace-Lorraine Brigade, which will liberate Strasbourg. Malraux contributes more than his fair share to the final victory. Our intellectual could well, in the end, weep for many of his peers who would never, alas, see triumph the values they risk their lives for. Et les autres alors, ceux qui, avec plus ou moins de scrupules, ont pris le parti de leurs assassins, où sont-ils Que deviennent-ils Comment vivent-ils la fin de cette guerre dont ils étaient si sûrs d'avoir épousé le parti vainqueur Eh bien, les revoici. Pour la dernière fois, les revoici. Égaux à eux-mêmes, n'ayant rien appris, rien compris, les revoici pris au piège d'une ville fantôme dont Louis Ferdinand Céline a immortalisé le manège lugubre et dérisoire, et où, grâce au ciel, leur aventure s'achève. I went to Sigmaringen, to which Pétain and his close circle fled in 1944, looking for their traces. Here, strangely, nothing has really changed. From these peaceful houses that one must picture as they were seized by the fleeing collaborators, Schoen, the pastry shop where they drank Erzatz coffee, Leuven, the inn where they claim to remember Céline, the strange doctor who stayed in room 11 and was always accompanied by his cat, Bébert. And finally the castle, perched above the little town, which had been owned for centuries by the Hohenzollern family and in which a miniature version of Vichy was set up.
There is Pétain, of course, who has an entire floor to himself, Laval, his former ministers and other collaborators, and also passing through Robatet, Abel Bonnard, Chateaubriand, and the actor Le Vigan, with his inevitable white silk scarf draped around his neck. In short, the most uncompromising pro-German intellectuals. And Céline, of course, whose sole purpose here seems to have been to leave us with his ludicrous portrait of this desperate bunch of collaborators. C'est intéressant à ce fait qu'il est, est assez cinéma, n'est-ce pas et, et puis, euh, il est pittoresque, n'est-ce pas, tout de même Et puis, il existe historique. Et puis, c'est un drôle, c'est un moment de l'histoire de France, malgré tout, l'affaire Pétain. J'imaginais très bien la, la vie du Moyen-Âge. Euh, C'est-à-dire les seigneurs euh, dans un coin, des seigneurs chez eux, et puis les vilains en bas. Alors, les vilains autour. Euh, et... et Là, vraiment, c'était une condition médiévale, parce qu'on peut considérer que les, les, les ministres et les euh, passés en sommeil, comme ils s'appelaient, ou en activité, étaient véritablement dans la position de seigneur. Alors que euh, les, 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 les collaborateurs du vulgum euh, vulgaire étaient vraiment dans la condition de vilain. It is August 1944. The masquerade will last eight months. Yes, for eight months, these pitiful characters will eat virtually nothing but red cabbage while waiting for the famous secret weapons of the Wehrmacht to show up and until all together different troops come to interrupt the daydream for good. In Paris, the game is over. The purges have begun, not as brutal as has been claimed, more measured, but with excesses, of course. A settling of scores, a whole climate of violence which will drive Paulin to say, why take it so far? A sincere patriot should be calmer, more reserved. The high court trials of Pétain and especially Laval are slapdash and leave those who witness them with a real feeling of malaise. These trials deeply divide our intellectuals of the resistance. On the one side, Camus and the supporters of strict justice. On the other, François Mauriac, who makes a plea for clemency. And between the two camps, rather flabbergast as what is happening to him, a 35-year-old poet, Robert Brasillac, who has become the test case of this important question. Is a writer responsible, and if so, is it to the death, for crimes which he did not himself perpetrate, but nevertheless applauded, condoned, or simply allowed to happen? The dossier of the Grâce had arrived, and I had the idea, probably not alone, I forgot to make a letter of General de Gaulle demanding the Grâce. Je vois encore avec Thierry Monnier, au Flor, où il est en ce texte, euh, les ornis, là, très, très, très coupés, c'est devenu un texte très court, qui a été signé par beaucoup d'intellectuels et que certains ont refusé de signer. 59 signatures in all, including in the last minute and not without some painful soul-searching, that of Albert Camus himself on the desk of General de Gaulle. Mon père a vu de Gaulle deux jours avant. Et De Gaulle lui a dit, je ne crois pas, je n'ai pas encore vu le dossier, mais je ne crois pas qu'il sera fusillé. Et puis, il a refusé la grâce. Drieux La Rochelle has known for a long time that it's all over. Alone and bitter, he has returned to his first wife, Colette Giramec, to hide. En 1942, nous avons croisé Drieux. Et mon père et lui ont parlé. Et on a déjà senti ce jour-là chez Drieux mon père m'a écrit quelques jours après, ou a écrit, je ne sais plus où, que Drieux déjà se voyait fusillé. Il y avait déjà, dès cette époque, chez les collaborateurs, l'idée que ça allait basculer. Ça l'avait peut-être, à cette époque-là, je ne sais plus exactement la date, ou du 42, c'est peut-être un peu après, je ne sais pas. Et ils, étaient, ils avaient un côté traqué, traqué déjà, à cette époque-là. Et c'est ce qu'on peut dire pour sa défense, quoi qu'il ait dit, fait ou écrit, c'est qu'il a eu le courage, tout de même, de faire face. You will remember that the surrealists with whom Drieux kept company in his youth used to ask themselves whether suicide was a solution. Well, yes, also it appears when one has systematically taken the wrong path all one's life, all that is left is to try not to make too much of a mess of one's departure. <laughs> 